to existing content. Colleen. Thank you, Connie. And can you confirm you're seeing my slides? Thank you. Yes. Thank you. As Connie said, I'm Colleen Funkhauser, the program manager for the Biodiversity Heritage Library. I'm presenting on behalf of my co-authors listed here who are members of BHL's executive committee and secretariat. Many of them are attending the session and are available for questions after the presentation. Uh, today, I'll be sharing ways in which BHL cultivated resilience during the global pandemic with a particular focus on improving access to the content already in our digital collections. The Biodiversity Heritage Library is the world's largest open access digital library for biodiversity literature and archives. BHL has been inspiring discovery through free access to the biodiversity knowledge for more than 15 years. Our collections include biodiversity literature and archives from the 15th through the 21st century. BHL operates as a global consortium of natural history and botanical institutions and libraries around the world that work together to develop the library, digitize their own natural history collections, and then make them freely available in BHL. The global virtual nature of this consortium was essential to our resilience in 2020 and our continued success in 2021. In April 2020, the BHL Members Council approved a new five-year strategic plan for BHL. Uh, this plan supports the goals outlined in the Biodiversity Next Conference from 2019 in order to support better data, better collaboration, and better science. The BHL plan includes five major goals specific to growing and improving BHL. The complete plan is available at the link provided. The events of 2020, including the COVID-19 pandemic, and social justice demonstrations around the world helped focus the priorities in implementing this new plan. Throughout 2020, BHL partners worked to define targeted implementation tasks and set priorities and specific deadlines for each goal over the next five years. Within the five strategic goals, I'd like to highlight some of the priorities we focused on in the last two years that exemplify the resilience of our global consortium. The BHL Collections Committee began a comprehensive review of the collection development policy, including a focus on identifying gaps in and strategies for improving representation of biodiversity information from underrepresented regions, languages, cultures, and perspectives. The BHL team, uh, technical team prioritized technical developments that improve access, discoverability, and reusability of existing content within BHL. This work was particularly helpful for researchers as well as BHL partner institutions who continue to rely on digital resources uh, without access to physical collections uh, during pandemic related closures. I'll also share a number of collaborative telework projects at our partner institutions that also contributed to improved access and discoverability of the BHL collections. And lastly, the BHL Executive Committee explored new partnerships that would integrate BHL data into existing and emerging biodiversity projects. We'll start with uh, collection development. What began as a broad goal, uh, simply to revise and update the BHL data uh, collection development policy was refined to prioritize ways to improve representation of biodiversity information from underrepresented regions, languages, cultures, and perspectives. BHL is also supporting larger efforts within the library profession to improve and broaden metadata, such as subject headings, to provide more accurate and inclusive description of collections. In 2021, uh, BHL's collection committee released an acknowledgement of harmful content in an effort to recognize the deep prejudices contained within some of the pages of its collection and to better understand our role in addressing the global challenges of species loss and social justice. In addition to rep repatriating knowledge, we can do more to grow BHL into a more complete and inclusive representation of the available knowledge of and perspectives on biodiversity. BHL has also had the opportunity to learn from digital humanities scholar, 
uh, Lydia Ponce de la Vega, as she utilizes BHL's metadata to identify and understand patterns in knowledge production and make recommendations for decolonizing natural history collections. As Lydia says, acknowledging and understanding colonial biases and knowledges of biodiversity are fundamental steps towards equitable, sustainable, and fair biodiverse coexistence. BHL also shifted the focus of some of our technical development plans over the past 18 months to support a shift to uh, more metadata enhancements to improve access and discoverability of existing content. Long planned improvements in the use of persistent identifiers were pushed to the forefront of technical development. We prioritized improvements to our data model to better support form digital content and content at the article level. We also made backend improvements to the BHL website to facilitate easier metadata import and updates, making it faster and easier to add article level metadata, which will improve uh, search and discoverability for articles within our collections. And in July 2020, BHL deployed a new name finding algorithm to improve the speed and accuracy of identifying scientific names within the BHL collections. To improve our use of persistent identifiers in BHL, we convened a new working group focused on making content in BHL persistently discoverable, citable, and trackable using DOIs. This includes retros uh, retrospectively assigning DOIs to historic publications and adding existing uh, publisher DOIs to the metadata in BHL. Though BHL has been assigning DOIs since 2011, uh, it was mostly at the monograph, uh, mostly to monographs. This new focus is on the workflows to add more article level metadata to items in BHL and assign DOIs to those articles. Nicole Carney, manager of BHL Australia, will talk more about this later in the symposium with her talk on retro foods. Another major service that BHL provides is taxonomic name recognition across its corpus. In July 2020, we deployed a new name finding tool from Global Names Architecture called GN Finder. The new tool increased the speed and accuracy of identifying names across more than 59 million pages in BHL. With the new tool, the entire BHL corpus can be indexed in less than a day compared to the 45 days needed for the previous index. Uh, after implementing this tool, uh, more than 47 million new name strings were identified in 2020 for an all-time total of more than 242 million instances of taxonomic name strings in the BHL corpus. Uh, these represent more than 14 million verified names, which are unique names that have been resolved against a name authority. Uh, we'll hear a lot more about the success of this tool and opportunities for further advancement uh, from uh, Dima Mazarin from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign in his talk later in this symposium. We'll also hear from Jeffrey Orr, research programmer at University of Illinois on the new BHL names tool that further, further utilizes taxonomic names found in BHL. Uh, these collaborative uses of BHL content have once again made the biodiversity data in our collections more findable, accessible, and reusable. As many of our partner institutions face closures or limited staff access to their physical collections, much of the usual digitization and ingest of new content into BHL came to a halt. Our partners transitioned quickly to projects that could provide meaningful work to staff isolated at home during the pandemic. These projects included transcription projects, uploading and tagging illustrations to Flickr, and efforts to define more article level metadata within volumes in BHL. We'll hear more about one of these projects at the Natural Hitch Museum in Paris in the next talk from Alice Lemaire, Director of Libraries and Documentation at MNHN. Each of these projects contributed to improved accessibility and discoverability of the content in BHL. At the Ernst Merrill Library and Archives of the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard University, the pandemic offered an opportunity for volunteers and staff to make significant progress on an existing project uh, to describe field notes that had already been digitized and uploaded to BHL. In 2020, uh, staff members and DigiVol volunteers worked on a project to transcribe the journals of William Brewster. More pages of Brewster's writings were transcribed in 2020 than in any of the previous four years of the project. Uploading these transcriptions to BHL further enhances the reach of the data in Brewster's writings. 
Once all the pieces are in place, that is, the items are digitized, metadata and OCR, or in this case, uh, transcriptions are deposited, the full text searching and powerful name finding algorithm used by BHL can help scientists to unlock data in these handwritten documents. Uh, the OCR can be used to extract the scientific names from the transcribed field notes and allow linkages within other BHL literature, both published literature and other field notes and correspondence. To close the research loop, links using the taxonomic names found in the transcriptions can be added to external databases from BHL to contribute to the extended specimen network concept. Another Teller project involved uploading and tagging images to Flickr. Flickr is one of BHL's most popular social media sites. The BHL collections are filled with millions of stunning scientific illustrations, but the image search within BHL is currently limited. In order to make it easier for users to explore these images, we make them available in Flickr. Throughout 2020 and 2021, BHL supported Telework projects focused on uploading images to Flickr, as well as tagging these images with taxonomic names, artists, geolocations, and more. In total, between 2020 and 2021, BHL staff uploaded over 166,000 images, which is more images than we uploaded in all previous years combined. Thanks to these Flickr-related telework projects, we now have over 319,000 images in Flickr, and these images have been viewed over 1 billion times. More than 47,000 images, or about 15% of our Flickr collection, has been tagged by volunteers, making our collections more accessible and discoverable. BHL has a long history of global partnerships, including the Encyclopedia of Life, GBIF, TAGWIG, and others. In 2021, BHL worked with Blasi to draft a statement of collaboration on how we can work together to extract biodiversity data from the literature in BHL and deposit it into biodiversity projects such as GBIF. We'll hear more about a collaborative project between BHL and Blasi later in this symposium with a talk from Blasi President Donat Agusti. And as we've seen earlier this week in Symposium 4, focused on the bicycle project, uh, BHL is supporting bicycle as a research infrastructure working to liberate data from literature. BHL continues to explore other opportunities to integrate BHL data into existing and emerging biodiversity projects. Thanks to the resilient nature of our global consortium, the work of BHL and our global partners continued throughout the disruptions of the pandemic albeit with a shift in priorities and focus. This focus on improving access to existing content in our collection uh, means that our collections of over 59 million pages are more findable, accessible, and reusable by the biodiversity community. You'll hear more about a number of these collaborative projects from the rest of the speakers in this symposium. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Colleen. Um, there is a question um, in the chat, which I, or in the question and answer. It's, has there been, have, have there been any thoughts on technical developments to help find and extract people and geographical names? I don't believe the focus of, um, actually, Donut may be able to speak more to that on the, um, outcomes of our collaborative project, uh, but we did not focus on particularly on names or geolocations. Uh, this actually will be in my talk. Yes. I was just gonna say that um, Dima might touch on this in his, his talk, so. Thanks, we'll Dima. See. All right, for right now, I think we will move on because the time is correct. So the next, the next talk is coming to us by video uh, from Alice Lemaire, the library director at the Natural History Museum in Paris. And I, I look forward to hearing this talk. She's going to talk about BHL and the, the pandemic, an accelerator of digital advances and transformation. Hello everyone, 
I am Alice Lemaire, Director of Libraries and Documentation at MNHN, the French National Natural History Museum. In this talk, I will present the way we build collaborative resiliency through the Biodiversity Heritage Library during the COVID-19 pandemic and the new challenges we are now facing. Before focusing on what we have learned from the sanitary crisis, let's begin with a few words about the MNHN, the MNHN Library and its commitment into BHL. The origins of MNHN date back to 1635 with the foundation by King Louis XIII of a royal garden for medicinal and teaching purposes. It became the National Natural History Museum in 1793 during the French Revolution. The MNHN collection today include about 70 million specimens. These collections constitute a global archive and a major research infrastructure. Being a very important center of research and teaching, the institution groups together several entities at 13 different locations in France. It is deeply committed to preserving biodiversity and to sharing knowledge with the public through its galleries, botanical gardens, zoos, and libraries. The library, consisting of a main library and several specialized libraries, is one of the world's largest natural history libraries. The collection contains more than 2 million documents of all kinds, printed and electronic books and periodicals, manuscripts and archives, maps, drawings, photographs and art collections. The library takes part in French Higher Education Libraries Network and it is associated with the French National Library, which offers many opportunities for collaboration at a national level. Digitization is among these opportunities and we built our digital library in partnership with the French National Library. The MNHN Library launched its first digitization program 20 years ago, beginning with the academic publication, the MNHN has been re releasing since 1802 and including the publication of the related learned societies as well. A second program devoted to taxonomic documentation began in 2014. It is a research-driven digitization program built in collaboration with the MNHN researchers. A third program shared the treasures of the library. This embraces precious books, manuscripts, archives, iconography, such as the famous vellum collection, scientific objects, or artworks. The MNHN Digital Library is harvested by Gallica, the digital library of the French National Library, and is also partly in BHL. Indeed, after participating in the BHL Europe project with the French National Library from 2009 to 2012, the MNHN Library became a BHL member in 2016 and started uploading content in September 2017. The complete collection of MNHN academic publication from 1802 to 2000 is now available in BHL. The publication of the learning societies related to the MNHN are to be the library's next contribution. During the first lockdown of the COVID-19 pandemic from March to May 2020, librarians in charge of content uploading to BHL were able to pursue this task full time, which increased the production. And the last BHL Europe files were loaded during this period of time. More than 100,000 pages were added in 2020. And as you can see on the graph, the production was especially high during the first lockdown from March to May. At that time, we had no access to the buildings, which was not the case in the following months. 
the production increased, so did the library outreach in 2020 by more than 70%, both in number of visitors and in number of pages viewed. It seemed that the emanation library is now better identified as the French access point to BHL, both by learned societies or by researchers who ask for information or for help. But beyond an increased production and a better outreach, the pandemic has also provided new tasks for remote workers. The first lockdown was a very difficult time, especially for people who had no remote work and felt deprived of their professional identity. So progressively new tasks were established for people for whom no remote work was yet defined. Among these new activities, a workflow for the creation of article level metadata was set up with the help of Roderick Page from the University of Glasgow. It works with metadata spreadsheets like this one. In red, you can see all the information added by the library staff, first and last page of each article, URL of the first page, or every other missing information about the author or the title. To this work, users can easily search and browse individual articles within several emanation publications, for which, like in this example, a table of contents button has magically appeared. So far, the work is done for four journals, such as Adansonia, as you can see on the right. It represents more than 1,000 articles, and a lot more are in the line. The pandemic turned out to be an accelerator of digital awareness and transformation, not only at the management level, but more widely for the whole library staff as well. By providing new tasks, BHL read inequalities within the library team and offered new opportunities. This greater involvement also strengthened the sense of belonging to BHL, which is definitely not only a resource, but also a community helping us get through this difficult period of time. Our goal is now to continue to perpetuate these projects. But turning emergency telework into regular tasks is a challenge we are now facing as library staff are back to their previous task in a fully reopened library. The second challenge is to capitalize on all this work in our own digital library by assigning DOIs as we are working towards a new digital library platform. This work on articles is indeed a driver for the evolution of the information systems. The emanation is currently redesigning its whole IT infrastructure for collections, helping the library to be part of a larger movement. The objectives of this new system are to better connect library collection and naturalist collections, and to face the challenge of interoperability in the European and international ecosystem in which the MNHN and BHL participate. I'd like to end this presentation with special thanks to Joseph de Villiers for his help with the retrospective loading of the BHL Europe files to Rodrigue Page for his stimulating collaboration on the article level metadata workflow, to Nicole Carney for her support in the DOI's assignment adventure, and to Connie Ronaldo and Colin Funkhauser, of course, for inviting me in this symposium. Thanks also, many thanks to the MNHN fantastic BHL team. Very much. Well, thank you. Thank you to, to Alice. Um, I don't see any new questions for her. Ah, okay. So there is a question in the in the question and answer. 
um, is the article discovery progress shown managed as a GitHub Trello board? If so, is it public? Um, and Rod, Rod Page answered that progress is public as are results. So I'm not sure um, if there are any other um, questions following that or if there are other answers that um, might come up. If anyone has one, please turn on your mic and tell us. Extraction of articles uses tools that are semi-public. Several of the, there have been a couple of questions in the question and answer that, that do have answers associated with them. Um, so please check that, check that out if you wanna see other, other answers. Um, Nikki Nicholson says, Alice showed a Kanban style board with cards indicating what was being worked on, question um, mark. I don't, um, I can't answer that. I don't think, I don't know if anyone else from BHL can answer that. Alice is not here today. So she'll have to check that. She'll have to check on that um, after this symposium. We'll make sure to point it out to her. Looks like there's a GitHub GitHub um, link in under that question now. All right, so if, the, if there isn't anything else to cover, um, we will move on to our next speaker who is also coming to us by video. And that's um, Jeffrey Orr from the Illinois Natural History Survey in Champaign, Illinois. His talk is Algorithms for Connecting Scientific Names with Literature in the Biodiversity Heritage Library via the Global Names Project and the Catalog of Life. Hello, everyone. Uh, today I'm going to talk about algorithms for connecting scientific names with literature in the Biodiversity Heritage Library via the Global Names Project and the Catalog of Life. Um, finding original species descriptions is essential for research, but it can be very time consuming. And this is made even more challenging by the fact that every currently accepted species has three scientific or has three synonyms on average. Um, so even just finding the original name can take a lot of time. Um, Biodiversity Heritage Library is the largest open access resource for biodiversity literature. Um, but basically finding the original species description in BHL can uh, be very time consuming because it's like finding a needle in a haystack um, because the metadata often does not exactly match the reference information. And then also the scan and OCR quality um, can sometimes be bad, which makes finding scientific names in uh, the library difficult. Um, but basically as the Scan and OCR improves, um, we can improve the search index, but because it's a moving target, it's really essential that um, we develop fast tools that can re-index all of BHL frequently, um, which is a major goal of the Global Names Project. Um, so the goal for this particular tool, the BHL Names Tool, uh, is to provide a name search, which will find all uh, likely matches of a scientific name in BHL um, and can take the scientific name plus any metadata you give it, including the journal or volume as input. Um, we can also do taxonomic search um, where it would find uh, the name you give it plus any synonyms for that name and the synonyms are provided by Catalog of Life. And then we're also providing original publication search, which attempts to find the original nomenclatural act for the scientific name. And then this tool could also potentially be used for reference linking, where you provide the scientific name and a citation, and the tool would return the um, link to BHL. 
So for the command line usage, which is the primary way to interact with BHL Williams right now, um, it takes scientific name in canonical form, um, yeah, or you can also provide the authorship in year. Um, and then you can optionally also provide it with a reference string to help improve the match. And if it finds nothing, it won't return anything, but if it otherwise it'll return all results with the best scoring match um, being the first one, and that is the most likely one to be the original description of the species. Um, so for the command line tool, here's an example of taxonomic search. Um, um, where basically you'll get the name that you searched for back as a name string, and then the canonical form without the author string, and then the current canonical, um, which is provided by Catalog of Life, because so the species got moved to a different genus, and then taxonomic search also returns all other hits for any other name that that species is known by. So in total for this species, it returns 142 results. And the output is in JSON. Um, for original publication search, it's a pretty similar um, uh, query, except it's only going to return the um, exact name match. And this is giving you the BHL link, um, which is this page right here. Um, and it also gives you the odds of it being the original species description based on our match criteria. And you're getting basically back the score for each criteria on um, why it's likely to be a match. Um, and generally, anything over 10 is really good. Um, so this is uh, probably a 98% chance of being an original species description match. Um, so in order to be able to provide this service, we're using a bunch of different algorithms. Um, the first one is to just return one name match per publication, because basically within a journal article, the same name is likely going to be mentioned more than once. And if we returned a match for every single one, it would just be uh, noisy search results. Um, we're also normalizing and enhancing a lot of the BHL metadata. We're disambiguating non-journals, non-standard journal abbreviations. And then we assess each result with several matching criteria. And we used Bayesian scoring to estimate the odds of a correct link to the original species description based on weighting match criteria. So one of the matching criteria is species annotations like species nov, subspecies nov, or combination or combnov. Um, and the main challenge with using these is that there's not a standard form. So different every author uses a different abbreviation. And then on top of it, the OCR also misinterprets characters. So we end up with hundreds of species annotations that we basically had to normalize into three labels um, that we then use um, as a matching criteria. Um, the next criteria that we use is title. Um, and the main challenge there is that uh, everyone has inconsistent journal abbreviations. Um, and our way of getting around that is to use um, acronyms for each um, title, journal title or book title, um, where we just take the first letter of every word in the title string um, like this. Um, and then for the short form, we eliminate minor words like of, the, and, a, um, and other words like that that are commonly removed from um, journal abbreviations. And that gives us a short form. And then using that, we um, use the how the Aho Karasik algorithm, um, which is a fast string matching algorithm. Um, so we've used these to build the search tree. And if you want to learn more about Aho Karasik, and uh, the Golang module that we developed, um, you can check out the GitHub repo, but we don't have time to cover it in this talk. Um, here's another search criteria that we use. Um, and the challenges with that is that we get multiple years from the BHL metadata. And the BHL model, it's organized into title, items, and parts. 
um, where item is often the um, actual physical object that was scanned. Um, so basically a, a journal can have a bunch of different volumes and they scan that item, and, but they're all under the same title. Um, and then each publication inside of the um, volume is a part um, in the BHL terminology. Um, so both basically each of those can have a year associated with it. Um, and then the years can be, or the years are often in strings and can be inconsistent in formatting. So, and then like another challenge of it is that it can span hundreds of years. Um, so our solution was to normalize the years to integers. And then we also attempt to match on the most granular year as possible, um, but still like improving the um, BHL metadata could drastically increase our matching accuracy. Um, another criteria that we use is volume and page. Um, challenges with that is there's a wide variety of different formats used um, in reference citations. So we developed a library of regular expressions um, to search for volume and page numbers. Um, it's also somewhat common to see Roman numerals um in reference citations and at present we're not interpreting those but it's a potential enhancement um, that we might add in the future and maybe we could also add matching on issues um, so to do the bayesian scoring we manually assessed whether 3,000 names matched the original species description in bhl and we used that as a training data set for bayesian scoring each result has um, then has matching odds with a breakdown of how well it's scored on each of our matching criteria. So we ran 4 million name strings from coal through BHL names, which took about 80 hours. So we've still got some work to do on improving the performance of the tool in order to be able to continuously improve it. Um, and then, and of those um, that actually got results, um, 200, about 250,000 of them have an estimated probability of 98% for being the original species description. There's 50,000 that have about an 85% chance and 175,000 that have about a 50% chance. And then around 5,000 that have a 15% chance but even the low scoring ones are actually somewhat useful from the standpoint that it's faster to check a reference quickly in the BHL names tool, even if there's a one in chance, one in 15 chance of being wrong, just because it's quick to use. Um, often uh, the match actually lands on the book index in BHL, and we still actually count that as a win because of. From there, you can quickly use the BHL user interface to navigate to the right page usually. Um, and the reason why we think we land on the book index a lot is because of a lot of times the species name gets abbreviated, unfortunately, in the literature. Um, and then we're not doing abbreviated species name in the name search indexing because of there's too many false positives when you do that because of a lot of other things match um, that pattern. Um, then another possibility is just bad OCR. So the index might have had a better quality scan and OCR, um, but at least uh, gets you there relatively quickly. Um, so all the data available for this is available for download at opendata.globalnames.org slash PHL names. This includes um, the scientific names with the link to the original description in BHL, the Bayesian score, um, the reference citation, and family name. Um, future potential use cases that we want to um, work on um, in coming months is integrating it with TaxonWorks as a reference finding plugin so you can um, view the original species description in TaxonWorks while curating taxonomic data. Um, we'd like to contribute the data back to BHL through, for their search um, tool via REST API. Um, and then we're also aiming to link Catalog of Life to references in 
uh, or catalog of life and catalog of life's references to BHL. And then another tool that we are developing is a embeddable JavaScript widget that would allow you to embed the tool on any website um, to provide a quick link to the original species description. Um, and here's a quick demo of that tool. So basically, you, know, you would um, embed the JavaScript widget and have the um, species name potentially referenced as the input. So then if a user clicks on the VHL book, they get a pop-up modal with the OCR text. Um, and if they wanted to view the original page, they would click this button right here, um, which returns this original scan. And then this link of the um, books will take you to the BHL library, or you can click on the scan page. Um, and then clicking the clipboard copies it to your clipboard. And then we also are thinking about taking user feedback on plus or minus, whether it's actually the original species description or not. To, continue to improve the scoring. Um, and then the same tool also works for the taxonomic search results where it would be returning um, any synonym names for that species. And then you could also look at the scanned image and link out to BHL and copy the URL. Um, and with that, I want to thank you for attending our talk and we'll take any of your questions. Well, thank you. Um, again, um, Jeff was on video, so he can't actually answer any questions right here. And there is one in the question and answer, and I'm hoping that Dima can answer it either after his talk or during his talk, perhaps. Could something similar to the S species nova detection be created to aid detection of lecto typifications? They would be indicated by phrases like designated here here selected, et cetera. Pointing to these would be very useful. Oh, it, it is an interesting so. question. I, actually, Jeff is here, so yes. uh, Jeff can answer. Oh, he probably. is here. Oh, OK, sorry. There, so, so there you go. Um, oops, you're not, you got to turn on your mic. You're, you're muted, Jeff. Jeff, I think it's your uh, speaker output that's not working because you're unmuted, but it's not the right uh, speaker. Oh, how about now? Yeah, there you that's go. That's good. That's All right, good. yeah, sound is challenging on Linux with Zoom, so that's why I did the video. Um, I think that that would be an interesting area for us to explore if we can reliably find the labels. Um, so uh, thank you for the question and suggestion. It would be nice to talk later about it and uh, uh, see what is possible. OK. All right. Um, so our next speaker, also from the Natural History Survey in Champaign, Illinois, is um, Dima Mazarin, who will sp speak about biodiversity, heritage library, and global names, successes, opportunities and the challenges for future collaboration. It's up to you, Dima. Okay. Uh, do you see the slides? Yes. Uh, okay. So uh, uh, we worked with BHL uh, starting from Actually, you buy uh, when Patrick Leary created first um, index of BHL. And then uh, later, when we started Global Names Project, uh, we sort of uh, jumped from one NSF grant to another to improve. Uh, so every grant would give uh, a new level of improvement. So with the first one, uh, we had a functional prototype. Um, and this is um, so. This prototype means that we actually did create um, scientific names uh, index. Um, and uh, this was mostly done by David Scherkhaus and me. Um, and uh, on the second grant, uh, we understood that uh, 
the first one was too slow. We did have to increase uh, speed absolutely dramatically. And uh, we did it uh, and actually uh, did it better than we hoped. Uh, so uh, I think now we all enjoy uh, like almost, um, uh, well, not instantaneous, but uh, now at least uh, you can, you know, uh, go to bed, start the uh, process and you wake up and with your coffee, you can see how it's finished. So, uh, and uh, uh, the third grant that I'm thinking uh, we can try, uh, actually maybe uh, two, um, is a dramatic increase in quality. Uh, we did have uh, increase in quality uh, during uh, step from one to two. And uh, uh, I will talk about um, what can we do better uh, with the uh, next, uh, next opportunities. So uh, what we are going through is 220 volumes. I don't have um, uh, some of them because uh, there is a, from some uh, different libraries, there are the same volumes. So I decreased the amount of those. Uh, but we still uh, have to work through like close to 60 million pages uh, when we uh, do our um, uh, discoveries uh, of names. Uh, so uh, we to, we uh, with the first one, the first attempt we had uh, 45 days. Now we're doing it in about eight hours. Actually, now it is about five hours, I believe, because we improved speed uh, a little more. Um, so now we we able to increase quality because now we don't have to wait for uh, you know one month and a half for results, and this is a good time for uh, uh, for our project to uh, to improve um, what we're doing. So this is a project that we use. Everybody can use it for their own purposes, and you can install it. For example, with Brew, um, it is a. a very popular package uh, manager for Mac, but it also works for uh, Linux and uh, Windows. Um, or you can just download one file and uh, it is executable file, this is pretty small and can use that. So uh, how I look at this um, thing that what we have, I, th I think about names as a first piece of a puzzle. And uh, it's not just the first piece of a puzzle for biodiversity uh, literature, it is, uh, one of the most important piece of the puzzle, like if you have a jigsaw puzzle, uh, it is like having an eye, right? So you find an eye and ah, okay, now I can you know, go around it and see where is everything. So uh, the project that uh, Jeff was talking about is sort of our attempt to uh, start to build this puzzle more. And, uh, and I believe that uh, with our approach, uh, uh, we can, like sort of makes sense what it is like this sort of looks like a puppy in in this puzzle uh so we can make a sense out of uh data in bhl but uh, something like plazi uh can improve on it further you know with the like build the rest of the puzzle uh, like more precisely so in this case uh, we have a name uh this is a like a pretty plant uh, uh, and uh, uh, we know that this plant uh, has a description according to Catalog of Life in full Sir Min, uh, 38 page uh, in the year 1908. So, and also uh, another piece of puzzle that we get from the names. Now we know for every item in BHL what it is about because. Uh, uh, we know uh, all the names in that we found in the item, and we can see are they plants, are they animals, what uh, group of animals is prevalent or plants is prevalent in, in the item. So in this case, uh, what we found, uh, we found that uh, this is a plant, it is Trachea fita, uh, and uh, uh, when we uh, looked uh, with our scores to BHL, we found, ah, there is a, uh, something with the 1908 in BHL. It has a name that matches uh, Fuller uh, Sir Min, which is that. And uh, 
uh, we also found that it is uh, reasonable uh, according to what is inside of this uh, journal, uh, I mean, inside of this item, but we did have a problem with the page. So page was 38 and this page is 104. And this is because what uh, Jeff was talking about, we found it in index. So why we didn't find it in a description itself? And here it is. Um, the problem is that it is uh, capitalized. And uh, when I tried to use uh, capitalized names for finding, I got a lot of uh, false positives. So I switched it off and uh, I decided to uh, to look uh, like kind of a classic uh, capitalization for scientific names. So we couldn't find that. We only could find the genus. And uh, this is a, a problem that we have. So let's look at the uh, what can we do to increase quality. First of all, uh, we can uh, fix um, all, all possible capitalization issues because now we have at least genus. And from this genus, we can uh, go further. And we also know names that belong to this genus. So we can actually look for if, if there is uh, uh, some episode that we already know in this book and try, try to find that. We can also find uh, people who are next to this name. So we can use uh, gene parser to figure out authorship. And uh, uh, in other cases, uh, we can have names that are patrimonial. So uh, they made, uh, 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 the, the name uh, is named after somebody. And also we have names that are named by popular uh, vernacular names like this Robert Geranium. It is capitalized. And uh, also uh, quite a lot of horticultural uh, volumes uh, by some reason capitalize their specific episodes. I'm not sure why. Um, uh, so, but really, really huge impact uh, in quality of name finding would be abbreviated names. Like you can see here, there is tons and tons of names that are abbreviated and that uh, we cannot, uh, we do find them. So they are in results of Gen Finder, but we cannot say what it is. Uh, and uh, uh, if we're able to crack this puzzle, we uh, increase 20-25% uh, our results for name finding. So this is a huge uh, task, uh, like a very big um, fruit that hangs not too far. <clears throat> and I think that this can be done by statistical analysis and by knowledge that we already have. Um, another problem that we have is uh, 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 funny names. <laughs> Uh, so, for example, like Kukaracha, uh, uh, which is uh, um, not a Kukaracha, actually, um, but, um, uh, you know, some pe people like to, uh, uh, when they're bored, they like to make uh, funny names in, uh, in uh, uh, biology. So there are quite a few of them. Uh, and uh, as a result, uh, we get uh, a lot of false positives. Um, uh, another problem uh, is uh, na uh, names that are called by people's names. For example, this one, Leonardo da Vinci. And uh, uh, if you look, uh, there are tons and tons of uh, generic names that are named by uh, you know, famous people wives, uh, lovers, uh, boyfriends, and so on. So uh, all these names are uh, create uh, false positives in uh, results. There are tons of geographical uh, generic names um, that also do the same thing. Uh, there is uh, quite a lot of uh, common, common words that uh, can be generic names as well, or sometimes uh, specific names as well. Uh, and uh, vernacular names, uh, they are usually point to uh, something similar, not always, but often. Um, and they create a uh, false positive as well. So what do we need to do? We need to learn how to use machine learning techniques and uh, without things that are in our own context. 
uh, like for example, when we uh, did um, Coffee Trust Library, uh, we picked all the political and the legal literature because Casus Belli is a snail. So the snails were crawling through whole political uh, and uh, uh, legal literature that uh, in uh, Hathi Trust Library. So, okay, we have scientific names and uh, people want vernacular names. So with vernacular names, the problem is even worse because uh, vernacular names have much more ambiguity. And uh, uh, if you solve a vernacular names problem, with the false positives, I think we will solve everything. Like uh, we, we, if we will solve uh, vernacular names, uh, we will be good enough to uh, like, we will have no problems with anything else. <clears throat> with people, of course, the problem is huge because uh, people who is called uh, Smith or, you know, uh, like popular uh, human names, it, uh, very, very hard to distinguish uh, false positives. However, because we already have names, from names we know, uh, for every person we can calculate what is the clay that this person worked in, <laughs> from names in uh, biological literature, in, in BHL, we can calculate uh, if this person could work on that particular uh, uh, organism that is, uh, determined by the name. Uh, taxon taxonomic uh, uh, data will help us to go back to uh, synonyms. So uh, I end uh, uh, by project, uh, like for example, what David Schutthau is doing with uh, binomial, uh, we can grab a lot of information that will be very useful to weed out like all the false positives, or even find uh, a name of the person from a very short abbreviation of this, of this name. And of course, something uh, like a Q list of uh, uh, botanical uh, authorships uh, abbreviated standard in the standard way would help dram dramatically as well. Um, and uh, yeah, and uh, uh, natural language processing as well. So if you solve people, I believe uh, we can crack uh, geographical names uh, with relative ease, uh, but maybe I'm wrong. Uh, that's that's my impression. The, the good thing about geographical um, entities, uh, it is more common problem. Uh, less people uh, search for biologists in literature, but more people search for geographical entities. So uh, I suspect that uh, with tools that we will develop to solve other problems, this one will be solved with relativists. And uh, uh, we do, we did have help from others, and we uh, think we will have help from others as well. And the self hopefully will help. Uh, uh, with Plazi, I think that we can go from sort of different sites, uh, like we go in shallow and uh, wide, and they go in. Uh, you know, slow and uh, more precise. Uh, a lot of help from uh, Rod Page with the uh, metadata that he uh, introduced um, and added to get by store uh, to BHL. Uh, and Thesson helped tremendously to weed out uh, uh, geographical names uh, that are pretty unusual and uh, uh, human names. Um, uh, binomia, uh, I think, will be extremely useful resource for people. And Zoho Bank uh, did, um, uh, in the previous grant, uh, they did uh, manual matching of names in Zoho Bank uh, with names to BHL. And that was also very helpful. And uh, for uh, natural language processing, I think we can study projects like Taxonyord and uh, see uh, like what kind of an approaches we can we can use uh, like deep learning uh, like tri uh, traditional natural language processing so we can we can figure that out uh, that's all thank you thank you so much dima that was pretty exciting um i i just want to note that there is a question and i i'd like to at least put it out there um, could book indices be used to test OCR quality? 
if the index has better quality OCR, then there's the assertion that phrase exists on page. Um, hmm. uh, the problem with the uh, indices, if indices are of a bad uh, quality that uh, we cannot uh, distinguish them very well, uh, usually that means that um, they're smaller text, right? So indices usually like two or three points smaller than main text. So usually they suffered first. So if you didn't find something in indices, uh, we have better chance to find something in the with the in the body of the uh, volume. Uh, there's one more. I think going to. I think we have time for another question. Um, proximity of named entities strikes me as a very, very useful signal. How might we assess the what's a good signal and what's noise in such pairs of entities? Oh uh, yeah, uh, this is pretty much uh, what uh, Bayesian algorithm uh, stands for. That uh, if, if you uh, have a bunch of uh, what you're looking uh, together, chances that. Uh, like dubious think next to that is what you look is much bigger than if it is uh, like in a desert of uh, uh, irrelevant information. So uh, yeah, we do use it. We definitely use, uh, use this. All right, well, thank you. I think we'll, we will move on. And I want to welcome our next speaker, Nicole Carney, the manager of BHL Australia in Melbourne. Um, she will be championing hashtag retro PIDs, the missing link to the foundation of biodiversity knowledge. Hi, everyone. Connie, can you confirm that you can see my slides? Yes, I can see your slides. Great. Um, and thank you to, to Connie and also to Colleen for inviting me to speak in this session and to the fabulously interesting talks. It's always fabulous to hear more about what the BHL community is doing. Um, I found all of those talks really, really interesting. So hello everyone, I'm Nicole Carney and I'm speaking to you from Melbourne, where I manage the Australian branch of the Biodiversity Heritage Library. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land upon which I work, the Boon Wurrung and the Woi Wurrung peoples of the Eastern Kulin Nation. And I would also like to acknowledge my co-authors, the members of the BHL's Persistent Identifier Working Group, or team retropids, because we're the ones who retrospectively assign persistent identifiers. This working group was established in October last year, just in time for me to talk about our very initial plans and goals at TAD Week 2020. So we've just turned one. We've achieved a lot in our first year of operation. Today, I'm gonna to tell you about those achievements and the challenges that we've faced. But first, I wanna thank these incredibly talented people for their dedication and hard work across this difficult year. We started this group six months into the COVID pandemic and we've met weekly since then. So these amazing people are as persistent as our persistent identifiers. Persistent identifiers allow us to uniquely, permanently and persistently find, cite, share, link and track digital content. The reason that we're retrospectively assigning persistent identifiers to the historic literature on BHL is so that we can bring that biodiversity knowledge, that foundation of biodiversity knowledge into the modern linked network of scholarly research. And because Rod Page has been telling us since 2016, we need to link all the things and that works best if we have persistent identifiers linking them. There are two key things that we need to do in order to achieve this. We need to assign digital object identifiers to articles that don't already have them, which is the majority of the historic literature. In order to make these historic articles discoverable, citable and trackable, by the DOI system. We need to add external existing DOIs to BHL articles, particularly for DOIs that resolve to paywalls elsewhere, so that Unpaywall can find our open access versions on BHL and point readers to them. I'm gonna use one of my very favorite articles on BHL to quickly run through what it takes to mint a DOI. Firstly, you need to gather the data associated with the piece of digital content you're assigning a DOI to. In this case, that's the bibliographic data for the article. This is by far the most time consuming part of the process and much of this tedious work has been done by our BHL volunteers. I personally wanna give a huge thank out to Bob Griffith and Heidi Griffith who work for me at BHL Australia, but we've also had BHL volunteers from Harvard University Libraries and New York Botanic Gardens working from this, on this project under the guidance of Diane and, and Susan. 
So thank you to them. Secondly, a DOI needs a landing page, a URL to resolve to. For scholarly content, a DOI landing page needs to include bibliographic data and a way to access the content. BHL landing pages are created automatically when we upload our BHL article data into the BHL administrative dashboard. So thank you to Mike and Joel for making this magic happen. And then we just need to mint the DOI. This is the easiest part of the process because Mike has basically created a mint DOI button in the BHL dashboard for all BHL contributors to use. And all we have to do is drop the BHL ID for each article into that box, click add, and the data gets sent automatically to Crossref, the DOI registration agency for scholarly content. And then the new DOI appears on the article landing page on BHL. And when that happened for our platypus, it became part of that great linked network of scholarly research. And I was so excited about this that I pretty much spent my entire talk last year at Tadwig talking about that platypus. But I didn't just announce it, announce it at Tadwig, I told the world via Twitter, and we got some really excited and enthusiastic responses from the members of our community. They said, both the idea of this DOIs for all and its actual content are absolutely brilliant. Good to know that an article published in 1799 can be assigned a DOI. Links like that are essential for citations and cross-references. It's new to me that BHL gives a DOI to its papers. This is really cool because it follows that the web of citations becomes so much more complete. Now we need this for every other species in order to finally get non-taxonomists to cite our top taxonomic papers. And put most simply, retropids are such a fantastic idea, which of course they are. So reassured that we were doing something really important and really valuable for the biodiversity community and taxonomists, we spent the next 12 months assigning retropids to the literature on BHL. And I really wish that that was the end of my talk and I could end with this happy story, but I really need to talk about the challenges. To quote Rod Page, retropids are a world of pain. Or to rephrase, the retrospective minting of DOIs involves a range of complexities and hurdles that must be negotiated before the historic literature can be incorporated into the modern DOI system. Basically, we're trying to fit a square peg, the historic literature, into a round hole, the modern publishing DOI system. And retropids don't fit very well. This means that our fabulous mint DOI button is now preceded by a series of warnings on BHL, which include, clean up your historic data. If we were minting DOIs for new articles, we'd have clean data that adheres to modern data standards but we're working with historic literature. And I, we try and always get a base data set and we scrape those from websites, we download them from library databases, or when we're really desperate, we use the OCR generated from historic contents pages. For articles that already have DOIs, they have existing data that was submitted to Crossref when the DOIs were minted, and we can easily download that from Crossref. But we've found that it's frequently riddled with errors like our base data sets, particularly when that data comes from commercial publishers who to appear, to appear to value quality over quantity. Sorry, they value quantity over quality. We at BHL value quality over quantity. The amount of work that's required to clean up our historic data sets means that sometimes we've resorted to gathering data from scratch and we've put an enormous amount of work into cleaning it up and make sure, making sure that you can find scientific names in that data and discover the articles. Again, I want to thank our BHL volunteers for their invaluable help with this work. And again, Team Retropid for all the work they've been doing to clean up the data. Definitely the biggest part of our process. The second warning that we've put in BHL is don't create duplicate DOIs. Again, this is not an issue for newly published literature as DOIs are usually assigned at the point of publication. It's really unlikely that there's another copy online at the point of publication. However, duplicates are a real risk when you're assigning DOIs for historic literature. There should only be one DOI for each publication, no matter how many copies there are online. I can't stress this enough. DOIs are supposed to be unique and duplicate DOIs stuff up citation linking and DOI tracking. It's also an obligation of our membership with Crossref that we don't create duplicate DOIs. So even though it drives me crazy that commercial publishers keep putting out of copyright literature behind paywalls, I can sleep at night because providing we add DOIs to our metadata, Unpaywall will direct users to BHL's open access versions. Our third warning on BHL is that if you're working within copyright content, 
back issues of, of journals that are still in copyright, you must obtain permission from the copyright holder. Thus far, every organisation that we've asked if they'd like us to assign BHL DOIs to their back issues has, a, has replied with an enthusiastic, yes, please. So we've now assigned DOIs to the back issues of all these journals and more with permission from the publishers, the copyright holders. These organisations have been really happy for us to proceed without a formalised agreement, but we're in the process of developing one so that we can obtain that from our copyright holders. However, our first attempt to mint DOIs for some of these older journals failed because the journals themselves were lacking ISSNs. This was an initial hiccup, but Susan successfully applied for BHL's first retrospectively assigned ISSN from the Library of Congress, another form of retropid, and she's now assigned DOIs for every article in this journal. And we're now in the process of applying for new ISSNs for other historic journals. Diane has just done this for Harvard University Publications. My final square peg comment is that while we can use retropids to link historic publications into the modern network of scholarly research, and we're doing this quite successfully, we can't use retropids at the moment to link our historic authors to their historic publications. This is the Crossref web deposit form. The only author identifier accepted by Crossref at the moment is ORCIDs. And as ORCIDs must be self-administered, you can't assign them retrospectively. I'm a huge fan of Crossref and I think everyone listening should have one, but we need Crossref to accept other author identifiers so that we can enter historic authors as things, not strings. I've been asking Crossref about this for years. In 2019, they assured me that a future version of their schema would include other identifiers, but thus far these have not been forthcoming. So we're a bit stuck here. In the meantime, we're adding VIAF and Wiki, Wikidata IDs to our BHL author records so that we can disambiguate those authors. And our BHL creator IDs are being added to Wikidata by our tireless Wikipedians. Now I chose Maria Sabella Marion for this example because she was featured just this week in the Tadwig pub quiz. That was a question I got right. And I was not at all surprised to notice that the Wikipedian who added the BHL creator ID to this Wikidata page was my dear friend and BHL super user, Siobhan Leachman. I know Siobhan's listening, so I'd like to take this opportunity to thank her for everything she does for BHL and particularly for women in science. So in our first year, BHL team retropids assigned DOIs to over 10,000 articles on the BHL website. I was very excited when we just tipped that figure at the beginning of this month. Over half of those DOIs were just assigned in September. And this is because our bulk upload tool has only recently been finalised, so we're really ramping up. So stay tuned for year two. We've added 3,581 external DOIs to BHL so that those articles are now discoverable by Unpayable. However, that's quite a small fraction of the total number of external DOIs on BHL. This is because Rod Page has been adding article data to BHL since 2012, and wherever they exist, he includes external DOIs in that data. There are now 3,012, 821 articles defined in BHL. That's the number from the beginning of October. It's probably more now. 73% of these were supplied by Biostore. So if we're talking about making articles in BHL discoverable, Rod Page is a retropid superhero. The other thing that we've been doing is developing new tools and functionality so that all of our BHL contributors can do this work themselves. And that's kind of the goal of this project so that BHL contributors not only upload the content, they also upload the article level metadata to make their content discoverable. So we can now bulk download existing BHL article data for all articles in all volumes of the journal. You can then correct and gap fill that data and you can then bulk upload it back into BHL. And we have that shiny new mint DOI button in the form of our BHL DOI assignment queue that queues BHL articles and titles for, B for DOI assignment via Crossref. And we've also developed documentation that explains how to create and edit articles in BHL and how to assign DOIs to that content. And I'd like to particularly thank Joel Richard and Susan Lynch for their incredible work developing that, that documentation. Finally, let's talk impact. The outmetric stats for our platypus DOI have more than doubled in their past year, and that's mostly because of my enthusiastic tweeting, but it's not only that. I've been actively tracking the performance of this DOI and I get notified of its research output. And I was so chuffed when it was cited in an academic paper last year using our new DOI. 
But then I was blown away when I was notified this year that it had suddenly been cited in a publication from 1999 and another from 1995, over 20 years before we minted a DOI for it. And I was a little confused, but it turns out that the publishers of these 1990s articles, which are Oxford Academic and Elsevier, had rerun their citation indexing which resulted in our retrospectively assigned DOIs being retrospectively linked to old citations. Now this totally made my year. I've pretty much been living in my living room, but this was so exciting. It sent me down a rabbit hole looking for other examples of this. I started with the most viewed book on BHL, which is System and Insure. BHL assigned a DOI to this publication in 2011. Outmetrics tells us that System and Aturé has been cited in 1,691 academic papers via its DOI metadata. The oldest of those was published in 1940. BHL assigned a DOI to Audubon's Birds of America in 2012. The earlier citation of this publication picked up by DOI tracking was in 1858. This is that publication. This 1858 journal article is behind a paywall on Springer. You can buy a PDF of the definitive version of this out of copyright article for 35 euro. Or you can click on that green unlock symbol, which tells you that Unpaywall has found an open access version of this article elsewhere. You click on that button, surprise, surprise, you're taken to BHL. Now, Unpaywall was able to find this article on BHL and direct readers to it because we provided the bibliographic metadata, including that critical DOI. As I mentioned before, there are now 62,000 external DOIs on BHL, and we're going to keep on adding them. So stay tuned for year two of Team Retropid. We've got lots more to do. So thank you again to my team, to all of the members of Team Retropids, to our volunteers, to the BHL community at whole, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Nicole, that's pretty exciting. I think we will move on to our last speaker, um, Donut Augusti from Plotsy. He will speak about the BHL Plotsy partnership, getting data from the 1800s directly into 21st century reused digital accessible knowledge. And I can see your, your slides. Okay, but I can't hear you, Donut. Is this better now? Uh, yes, now I can hear you. Okay. Well, hi, thank you for inviting me, even if it's late at night here in Switzerland. I will talk about the BHL Plotsy Partnership. And for those who don't know us, hold on. So we have kind of a parallel life. In 2003, we got a grant from the Atherton Seidel Foundation together with the Biologia Centrale Americana and the Walter Reed Institute to be the first recipients of the, this grant to start digitizing publications. We digitized all ant literature and did something to the world because everybody liked it and we had a huge amount of people watching that. In 2008, I happened to be in New York, in, uh, in DC, when the announcement of the Integral of Life took place. And with that also the start of BHL and many other things. So if you're interested, go listen to this. It's really a remarkable piece of uh, history. So Plazi in 2021 maintains two infrastructures and is tightly interwoven with the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. The Biodiversity Literature Repository is essentially our long-term repository. So if plots disappears, our liberated data will not disappear. We are focused not on publications, but we're focused on data in publications that today called fair publications or fair data. We have like 410,000 images liberated from publications from 65,000 articles precisely. We have 190,000 taxonomic treatments, each with a DOI, and together this represent about 600,000 reach of PIDs. In Treatment Bank, that's our processing infrastructure, 
we have 1.3 million pages processed so far. We have 620,000 treatments with over 1 million material citations. And it's obvious the number of treatments in treatment bank is much higher in, than in biodiversity repo, literature repository. And that's the reason because we care about quality, have quality control, and release only data which fulfill some minimal criteria. In the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, we are the biggest data set provider by about 60%, where we provide 34,000 treatment article data sets. These are a version of articles which include treatments and material citations. They include 340,000 taxonomic treatments, 90,000 unique species, which are unique because nobody else, neither as an occurrence nor anywhere else, cited these species. And these are most, in most cases, species which have been described today or a couple of days ago or maybe some years back. It includes 220,000 figures and about half a million material citations. And again, there are 500,000 material citations waiting to be moved into Global Biodiversity Information Facility. If you compare that figure to what biodiversity literature, the Biodiversity Heritage Library has, it's different. So they have like 170,000 titles, 273 volumes, and 60, 60 million pages, and 320,000 images. So essentially, it makes sense to look at the complementarity of that. So there's not a competition, but it's really interesting because BHL is really up into the high digits in, in making literature accessible so everybody can do something to it. And we are interested in making data accessible so it can go into the research data life cycle. So we're very happy now that we, we realize that our data is really part of the research data life cycle. That means we process, we process data, it goes along, it goes to GBIF, a scientist comes along, it reuses the data, it publishes again, it comes back to us, and we, we republish that. So there can, there can be two or three material citations for the same specimen now. And that's are not, those are not duplicates, but this is the story of this, of this specimen, of this occurrence. It tells you who cited it and under which conditions. So what we do essentially, unless it's maybe a repetition of what we have been talking about yesterday night, we have in treatment bank a workflow that takes publications, it decodes that, which is a very, very difficult thing for PDFs. It enhances semantically, does data quality, it creates open fair data. That means it uploads data to, to Zenodo, to the biodiversity literature reports. It makes it accessible to everybody anywhere at any time. It has some access metrics. It disseminates data, so it goes into into tree, into achieve if it goes on. So last <clears throat> this year, we, we we wrote a statement of collaboration between the BHL and the Biodiversity Literature Repository, repository to make use of this complementarity. Essentially, what this means is that BHL is finding, scanning, OCRing, DOIing literature articles. It will give them to us, we process it, and together we upload this to as data to, to uh, achieve it as a BLOTC BHL treatment article publisher. That means essentially now data blocks of text, treatments, and so on, they go from BHL into the on into GBIF and can be cited, it can be reused. Right now, in September 17, we, we established the, this, the, 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 the publisher, so we can start publishing. We did some test load ups, and we, at the moment, to look into what we, we like, what we don't like in terms of appearance. So there is a sandbox, so we can go look at that. And essentially, this is what you get when you go on a, on a, on a DOI on, on DHL, and this is the view of your article in, in GBIF. And in a little bit in the background, what happens, we take this article, we get the, the PDF, we process that, we make it into our system, we extract the figures, we put them into, into BLR, provide the DUI for it, we take the, 
the treatment out, we put them also into BLR and make provide a DOI, or we have like a persistent identifier on our system. And together we, we import this as a Darwin Core archive to GBIF. But it's not just the article, it's actually what we wanted to have that we, the article has like accepted names. So it produces a list of texts in the publication. And more importantly, each of these cited specimen, listed specimen is completely resolved because because you can get the entire data inside. The data in the format that the, anybody can come in and do more research and more other things like text and data mining. Similarly, the occurrences, they are extracted, they are presented as a table of, of um, occurrences and each occurrence can be viewed as all the rich metadata. And of course you can follow back from, the, from this record to the the, the GBIF uh, article data, treatment article, back to the Rabies Physiology or the original DOI. Right now, <clears throat> we have established this, this publisher. We have an upload in, in, in GBIF sandbox. It looks not the complete way it does because when we upload through our Darwin Core archives, it does something more and more refined. So you can go look at any of the the plots he uploads and see how it will look like. What we need to do is on the VHL side, really look into OCR issues. This is crucial. And I will come back to that in a minute. On the plots side, we have to create entire workflow so we can upload something by machine from VHL. It comes in our system and the system knows that it has to publish, publish this into the, plot, into the VHL plots site on GBIF. What you also need to do is we have to define data quality. How much OCR errors do we want to accept? How many other errors do we want to accept? What is the granularity? We want just treatments, material citations, parsed out material citations, or names which are annotated or attributed. We have to define who is responsible for QC corrections. Are you doing, is BHL doing that? Is this community who is doing that? We have tools where we could involve the community to do that. We have to define the entire data workflow. And last but not least, the tricky issue. This is a big issue, talking about 500 million pages, it's funding. So this is kind of where we stand right now. So we didn't publish a lot, and I explain in a minute why. But this is statistics, you can get our uh, statistics. So if you go on this, this um, our our uh, statistics page, you can download and explore all what we have. You can go into details and figure out how many figures there are extracted, how many taxonomic names and so on. So go and explore. And if you have any questions, ask us. So the, as Timmy already mentioned, OCR is an issue. So OCR is not just like a character that is wrong, but also blocks of text are wrong. So if blocks of text are not properly aligned, then if you work on templates and templates are needed to, to learn the machine, the structure of a document, then it messes up. And messing up means a lot of labor. So we have to go back and find out. We can discover errors, but to fix it is very expensive. So essentially it's important that the blocks are in the right position. Timmy also pointed out taxonomic names and OCR issues. So a crucial issue is that we get taxonomic names right. And unfortunately, italics is horrible for OCR. So look at this, here is on one of the very early review systems zoology, a taxonomic name and the OCR we got from, from EHL. It doesn't really help very much. The problem here is if you don't get this taxon identified, we don't really know that this is a treatment. The machine will not know. We might know, but the machine will not know it. So this is really, really a crucial thing. Whether OCR is in text blocks a problem or not, that's sort of a question of whether you like to expose things like that or not. I guess in this case, you rather don't expose that because it's not really something you want to have. Another problem is that if 
the OCR is not properly done. That means the, uh, the, the, the text blocks are shifting on the page. So you have a page and the text is not always in the same line, like in a printed document. Then there's not is a problem to discover the blocks and discover um, text flow. So it does not really find the header. And then the text flow creates an error. Another problem is that tables like written italics are often not discovered and not OCR. So this is not in the text. One solution which does not scale up is to use Abby and do OCR on, lo uh, on the local scale before we, we process data uh, publications. But this, again, it helps if you really need to have a document processed and just to look nice and all that. But it is not a way, way forward. <clears throat> An issue which has already brought up is language. There's a high degree of QC issues that demand local language expertise. We can ex extract Chinese treatments because they use Latin names for species, or we can use Arabic, or whatever. That's not a problem. But to do something more, we need local, local language expertise. We don't have that. But maybe GBFest, uh, BHL has it. Material citations, that's probably a target where a lot of interest is because there's a lot of data included, like special, uh, people names, locations, uh, increasingly um, citations of specimen. This again needs local language knowledge, but also geograph local geographic knowledge. So it's difficult for a Brazilian to understand what's happening in Switzerland on, on the Jura Mountains. One thing is very pleasant is sort of figures. Figures are really well done. It's really cool. So we can offer that editing, including OSA corrections in small scale, can be done using treatment banks. So we have tools, so we can log in, you can download the, the, the respective articles and fix them, upload them, and it goes immediately to GBIF. So we have a system set up that if there's an error, people in, in GBIF complain or send a feedback, we immediately can react and it works very well. But again, fixing errors at large scale does not scale up. What would really would be helpful is to redo the OCR, maybe in collaboration with archive.org, and I think they, they use the new version of Tesseract, which is much more powerful. So maybe it's well worth to really get, get together, talk about OCR quality output, and see whether it delivers what's needed for large scale uh, production. Another is start from low hanging fruits. Don't start on the first issue from a journal like the Rebusy as we did, but start from the best, the latest one. So learn move backwards. Maybe that's, I know it, it's a bit of a tricky issue, but start from English-based articles where we have expertise in our rounds right now and then expand to other languages. This is not to, to, to make English better than anything else, but I think we are at the beginning of a very steep learning curve if you really wanna tackle the 500 million pages. If you really wanna discover what we know we really need to put a strategy for that. Thank you. Well, thank you, um, Donut, especially you for being here so, at such an odd hour um, and others who, who are, are um, speaking outside of their normal hours. We do have another question in the Q&A um, to Dima, Donut, anyone here, is anyone helping us yet with tools to visualize clusters of OCR issues to fix them in a more systematic way? Carrot squared ideas to visualize tokens. This is a huge way the public could help and it's visually interesting and interactive from Deb Paul. Hi everybody. So. And I also added, a, I edited it. I don't know if you can see it, Connie. And it could also be used for this local language clustering potentially that Donut was raising the need for. So when, and Rod, if you're here, I haven't seen the tool you, you pointed us toward. 
Is this still a tool that's essentially cleaning up one document at a time? I would just say the most important thing is to avoid errors. I think I really oh. recommend, I recommend that BHL is looking into professional aid to improve the uh, OCR. It is not done by using people helping correcting OCR. If you think about million, tens of millions of articles or correcting 500 million pages. Hmm. Uh, last study, Joe was talking about um, improvements in OCR. Uh, so I wonder uh, if uh, uh, there is a progress on this already in BHL. Maybe. I, I guess I was thinking more, and I, I appreciate Donut's point, you know, just the better we can get the machine tools to work. But I was thinking in the number of times that the the error is the same. So if Tallahassee is read as Tallahassee, but all the L's have been changed to ones, then you have a cluster and it's the same error. And then your machine tokenizer can tell that that's the same string across the whole thing. Then you could fix all the instances of that string in one go rather than the one document at a time. But of course, Donut's point that, you know, get OCR to be better in the first place, great. But uh, meanwhile, this is another way to, to also search data. If you can tokenize these things and they can be clickable to return the results that they're clustering, mm -hmm. that's also a cool way to explore the data. Anyway, uh, there is another I what, what, pardon. I think what, what Deb says is important. We should learn from errors. I think errors should not be our enemies at that stage. We should really use them to help us to direct where you have to change. So if you have like spelling errors, then you can train your, your OCR system. But I mean, it means you have to run an iterative system. So you run a test set, you spend a lot of time in, in correcting OCR errors to train the system. So it understands italics or other fonts and then run the batch again and test. Uh, another thing that we can do uh, from uh, name finding uh, we actually can see where uh, OCR is definitely bad. Uh, and uh, we can pinpoint on uh, um, uh, items uh, in BHL that uh, seem to be the worst. Uh, uh, so the, the way we can see it uh, that um, uh, when we do name finding, we do it uh, in a fuzzy way. So if something looks like a name, but it's not a name. We also find it, and uh, we can we can see these kind of pages. Um, so maybe maybe we should create a, like a database of bad OCR or something. <laughs> there's a there's another comment from um, Rod Page that OCR seems to be the main stumbling block to maximizing the value of BHL. We all know this, but seem to avoid tackling it. Will this always be the case? And um, Rebecca Snyder from the Smithsonian mentioned that the Smithsonian's Digitization Program Office has been experimenting with machine learning for handwriting and historic fonts with some success. Um, so maybe it's not hopeless. Uh, I think it is getting better. Uh, like uh, sometimes I find uh, some old page in Gothic uh, font that I cannot read. And uh, it is easier for me to read OCR than the uh, font itself. And, and it is, you know, Donut noted that it's really an issue um, that's beyond biodiversity literature, which is true. I mean, this is not, this is not a new problem and it's not just a BHL problem either. <clears throat> and we are looking into ways to work on that problem, but um, yes. Um, Connie, can I just jump in and say, yes, um, please. So following in on, on Rebecca Snyder's comment, yes, I'm one of, I've been talking with some of the high-speed computing people about how we could do some of these testings and AI improvement of OCR. Another um, proposal from Alyssa Herman at um, <clears throat> Natural History Museum Berlin, who's uh, coming from an OCR background again, is our some competitive OCR testing where we're, you know, put Tesseract versus Abby and then 
pit them against each other to, again, fuzzy matching on OCR stuff. So I think there's lots of possibilities on improving OCR and, um, and it's something that's in the bucket list of things to be doing sooner than later. Thank you, Martin, for jumping in. In, from our BHL blood C interactions, this is crucial. If you don't get the OSA right, in a sense, it's almost useless to spend time on getting things out. You can do it for a particular project and for fun things, but we talk about millions of pages processed, entire journal runs. And we cannot, because anything you do afterwards becomes very expensive if you have to fix it back. So if OSAR is wrong or the, the boundaries are wrong, then you have to go back and redo the entire processing again. So we should really have a control that how well is the, the, uh, the OCR. Mm -hmm. And if the OCR has a certain quality level, then we start processing. Otherwise it's a huge waste of time. I'll also add that right now, the majority of the BHL content um, has been processed with Abby but we are going to start systematically reprocessing those through Tesseract um, in conjunction with Internet Archive. So that um, reprocessing with Tesseract will be occurring over time. Uh, Martin, it would be really great uh, to know um, when you do it so we can compare. Uh, mm -hmm. Like, you know, if uh, uh, what kind of names we found uh, uh, with Abby and what kind of names we found with Tesseract. We can also, since um, it's a request we can make, we can actually request where the pro reprocessing occurs. So we could actually, if we want to do it as a controlled experiment, we could actually just like target a set of, of items and then actually do the reprocessing on those so we'd have an actual um, real test case where you can do um, a controlled um, evaluation. Uh, Carlos Martinez uh, has hand up. Oh, thank you. I did not see that. Please go ahead and turn on your your. Thank you, Dima. And... Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, one of the things that I was going to say was that exactly it's really important to reprocess with Tesseract. And it seems to be functioning quite well and improving because now it can recognize entire lines rather than recognizing individual letters and individual words. So that's actually a huge step forward. And the other thing is that it's working the same for recognizing handwriting. And there will be more and more handwritings and especially mm -hmm. both types of handwriting being added. So for example, the German Consils Protocole now is available and has a workflow there. And I think that maybe within the next uh, three years, we will get the current Strift and uh, Suterlin Strift in. So, and those things will start happening. Uh, the other thing was regarding the DOIs, uh, sometimes it's not possible to atomize the old articles into a unit, a continuous unit of pages. For example, very often the plates were issued differently. So when assigning uh, DOIs to all articles in BHL, it's also important to think if we are going to assign sub-article level DOIs that will point to somewhere else in the volume. Yeah, because sometimes the plates are not contiguous, are really far away. And we need to find these plates and we need that the DOI or a sub-article level DOI points to the plates. So that's one challenge that you have when assigning retro DOIs. And the other thing is that we currently don't have a unique layer of identifiers for the same page across different scanned resources. And this is also a problem. So I'm trying, for example, to, to add links, like the permanent URLs to pages in my database to point to BHL and BHL treatments. But the thing is that the same page exists maybe three times or two or so. So we need a layer of unique identifiers for 
pages and not for every single, like, like the same page every single time, but an, a layer on top of that. So that we have, a, and this is something that will also help in name recognition. So I did a, a short human scale curation and seeing how were the matches across the same volume or the same work for a given taxonomic name and tabulated that. And it was very often the case that across different scannings, some page were recognized in one and not in other, but there was no consistency with this work is a better quality scan and this one is not, it was like patchy. So if we add a layer pointing to the same page across works, we will be able to improve the matching of the same thing and complete across works because it's, it's a patchy thing. And I already talked too much. You can reach me easily through Dima if you want to talk more. Thanks. And Carlos, just a, Carlos, one quick comment. Um, the BHL page identifier is a unique identifier, but it's not necessarily a global unique identifier. But one of the things that um, the retro PID group will eventually get around to um, is, again, thinking about, again, assigning those global unique identifiers at the page level. And right now I'm promoting the ARC archival resource key as the um, that identifier. And again, we can think about how that could roll up those multiple instances of the same page across multiple works, which may have different DOIs. And and what, what, it... Go ahead. Uh, while we were running, um... Uh, named uh, this uh, nomenclatural descriptions um, uh, tests from uh, uh, catalog of life. Uh, we actually did find uh, quite a few uh, uh, duplications of pages uh, with the same description. And uh, uh, if you're interested, we can create. Uh, uh, you know what we found. We can we can create. Or also like a small uh, file or a small database that uh, contains duplication uh, of uh, pages maybe might be helpful. And there Can was I just a address the comment about plates? Go ahead. Um, we have been meticulously, um, and by that I mean manually, attaching the plates that appear at the end of historic volumes to the articles themselves. So that's something that was a huge problem for us initially that um, that are matching. So Rod has amazing kind of algorithms that will match the, the page IDs on BHL to the page numbers. And that relies on those page numbers being correct and that data in, in BHL. Often a lot of the historic journals we've been working on don't have page numbers at all. But one of those biggest problems was the fact that the plates for a lot of those historic journals are all lumped together at the end. And so we have to say, an article starts on page one, it goes to page 12, but also at like page 365, there are 12 plates that go with that article. So we've actually been manually doing that so that when we eventually get onto um, gener pre-generating PDFs, which is something that's coming soon, Joel's working very hard on that. Those pre-generated PDFs will contain the article, the consecutive number of pages of the, the, in the journal, and then the whatever plates are at the end. So we're on that. Um, and yes, it's a tedious problem that is taking us lots of time. And thanks again to our volunteers for doing that. Thanks, Nicole. Um, there is a question from Deb Paul for Carlos. Um, for the handwriting, Carlos, or people using the, the Suderland labels, which have been transcribed as training sets. If you're still uh, here. What, what I'm planning to work with is I have been scanning uh, all letters from a German taxonomist, uh, mm -hmm. Karl Wilhelm Ferhoff. And the good thing about this is that it's, it's, it provides a, a larger training corpus than labels. So labels are good because they are quite atomic and, and you can like, like recognize easily what it is because it's often repetitive, but uh -huh, uh -huh. with letters, you can really train an algorithm based on, on full lines of text. And then you have many lines, one under the other one, and you just uh -huh. need to make sure that, that you manually transcribe certain number of those lines and then feed the images and feed the transcribed lines to the to the 
Tesseract uh, ground truth. Mm -hmm. And then you train the algorithm on that and you can use other sorts of scripts together with that if, you're, if your ground truth is too small. Hmm. And then you can deploy that over a larger corpus of scan um, text that is not transcribed. And then hopefully, I don't know, I, I guess that if we could get 80% of recognition, of, of character recognition, that would be already great for handwriting. Hmm. One thing that is not solved with Tesseract and that, that will be cool to include in any larger project with funding is try to uh, get coding hands into improving uh, line recognition within Tesseract because the recognition of individual lines is still deficient and is a limiting step in the process. But Tesseract is certainly the, the way to go. From, from mm -hmm. my side, I would recommend it. Mm -hmm. um, there's one more question. Deb, do you wanna just ask your last question? Which one was it? The OCR uh, outputs against language yes. detection? Yeah. Yes. So I was just curious when uh, Dima, was it who, or Donut, who brought up the language problem? I was Donut. curious. I mean, I know it's expensive, but I, running against the language detection API that you could figure out what language or where in the text in the corpus of BHL. Uh, language is very tricky. Uh, like uh, every uh, every item in uh, BHL has language uh, attached to it. But if you look inside, you, you can find uh, a lot of uh, different languages even on one page. So um, I'll just add that, to that, Deb, yeah. just that just, um, oh. when we run the original OCR, at the Internet Archive on the content, the language dictionary that's selected is based on the bibliographic language tag in the MARC record uh, from the library. Okay. So again, it, just to highlight what Dima just said, again, a, a book that's in multiple languages, well, well, it usually can only get one language tag in the bibliographic record. Um, so that can make it tricky, but generally speak, and we also set, for instance, non-Roman character languages to English, which is a bad practice, I know, but again, it helps with the OCR, the scientific names. So, um, so there is an initial first cut of language for the OCR dictionaries. So I'm thinking on my teeny tiny scale, right? I haven't, you know, the scale at which you all are working. My experience has been using the Google API with a bunch of labels and saying, you know, tell me the languages that you find here, right? And of course it spits them all back for me. Um, so, you know, me, I want to think big and say, why not just throw all the pages out? And it just tells you what the languages are it finds on every page. Why not? Sorry, <laughs> I can't help it. Well, the, the problem, uh, I think, is it's not language detection. The problem is actually to understand the language. See, what we do is not understanding this is a French paper. It's really understanding what's in the paper. Is this sentence about a behavior? Is this sentence about what? And that's why the language is a problem. It's not de detecting, uh, detecting French or English or so. So that's in a way that the, the difference between citing articles where you would cite, this is a French article, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to be able to export a mature citation and achieve it because you're sure this is a sentence which says this specimen is in fountains in Fontainebleau. All right, well, we are nearing the end of our time and um, I don't know if anyone, I don't see any other questions in the question and answer. Um, so I think we can wrap up. And again, I wanna thank everybody, everybody who came, everybody who asked great questions and all of the speakers for um, telling us everything that's, that's coming our way. Thanks, Colleen and Connie, for organizing this session and all of our speakers. Yes. Very exciting, interesting things. <laughs> all right. I will see everybody at another, at the next one. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow.
Um, remember that all of these talks um, are recorded and they'll be up um, around sometime midday tomorrow. Great.